Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Thanks all for coming. And thank you uh, for bringing with you your thoughts and ideas about Venice because we're hopefully going to engage you in our discussion at the end. Uh, this is a panel, as it says, dedicated to the city of Venice, our host city. Uh, indeed, one of the most overlooked dimensions of the Venice Biennale is that it takes place in Venice. Somehow we take it for granted all the way to the point where we forget about it. And the Venice Architecture Biennale has always had something like a lover's quarrel with the city. Uh, the early Biennales somehow absorbed the city completely. They had competitions about it. The Biennale was almost dedicated to the city to the point where the, it made it uh, too local. And then as the Biennale aspired to be more international, somehow the city got ignored, even though it's the only city that has its own pavilion here. In this particular Biennale, I would say that we look to Venice to be both our living laboratory and our inspiration. In thinking about the five scales, we addressed the city, or we looked at the city to help us think about how we can address these five scales. Thinking about the, planet, the planetary scale, we thought of the climate change issues and the water level rising, and how a project like the Mose could be present in the Biennale to illustrate and to help us think about the relationship between a locality and something like a climate crisis across the globe. In thinking about working across borders, we went to the roots of the city, its origins as being a city that straddled between east and west, as made of an archipelago, uh, a network across different borders and bridges, and internally a city that is made out of multiple ethnicities, and how these can cohabitate. In thinking about the scale of communities, we thought about the presence of tourists and how they interact with the local communities and how the city has, over the years, been very experimental in turning its social equipment, the Library of San Sovino, all the way to the Hospital of Le Corbusier, as entities which are at once servicing but also providing a new public realm. And thinking about the household scale, we look to the city as inspiration for the many different experiments that have happened over the years about how people can come together in tight spaces in order to share facilities, but also create different models of community. And when we came down to the scale of among diverse beings, we looked to the lion. The lion, the winged lion, which is a hybrid creature that is uh, the symbol of the city and who resides in a paradise-like garden, the Giardini, and thought of the possibility that this garden, this, the Biennale, could provide a kind of paradise, the ideal space for thinking the future of the planet with coexistence with these hy hybrid beings like the Venice lion, uh, even if it is momentary, even if it is fictional, as a way for us to project better futures for the world. We pulled all of this together in one room at the end of the Arsenale exhibition, uh, dedicated to the city of Venice. And we invited universities and artists and architects to come together to help think Venice with us, but to also present Venice to the world. We wanted not only to think Venice, but also to thank Venice, because this has been truly a challenging year for both the city and the Biennale. And we commiserated a lot with the city this year, but we came out strong together. So before I turn it to Roy Salguero, who is going to co-moderate this panel with me and introduce the panelists, I wanted to thank Venice and thank you for coming again. Roy. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, looks like. Uh, so thank you, Hashim, um, for introducing the topic. Uh, yes, the presentation basically will, um, will be made by our three participants, three team participants in the room that we dedicated to Venice. 
So I'm going to present them with what we hope will be their order of appearance. Um, some of them are here, as you can see. Some of them will join us remotely. So first of all, we will have a team composed by uh, Laura Fregolent here and Paola Rizzoli. Paola will join us via Zoom. Paola, um, she's a Venetian, but she works at MIT, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which she joined in 1981. She's a professor of physical oceanography and climate. She's the author and co-author of 147 scientific refereed publications in international journals and 14 refereed books as well. She has worked, she has worked sorry, since the early 1970s on the problems affecting Venice and its lagoon. And in the exhibition she has here, she has collaborated with uh, uh, Laura Fregolent, an architect, a full professor in urban planning at the University UAV here in Venice. Her research focuses on urban sprawl and interactions with policy and planning tools, urban transformations and social dynamics, the relationship between processes of growth and morphological and socioeconomic transformations. In the last several years, her research case study has concentrated on the city of Venice, and Laura and Paola together have an installation that you may have seen that actually deals very clearly and strongly with the effects of climate change on the city. Um, probably our second contributor, if everything's going well, is uh, uh, a representative of one uh, uh, Netherlands studio, Studio LA. We will have Lorian here with us. Studio LA is an architecture studio uh, based in the Netherlands, as I said, by architects Lorian Beijaert and Anna Makik. For Studio LA, the practice of architecture is a device through which societal issues, phenomena, and narratives can be investigated and placed in transformed perspectives. And we were very happy and very uh, um, um, uh, fortunate to come with, with their um, expertise and their kind of insights in the installation that they have in the Venice room, which is a fantastic floor tile that you can like walk into and it also like breaks. It's a very beautiful and, and polemical, but also like poetic installation. And finally, we have uh, with us a, a group composed by Sandro Vista, who is uh, here with us, and Nicolas de Monchot and Bill Sherman, who will join us remotely. So Sandro Vista is coming from Visa Associati, an architectural practice founded in 2012 by Sandro and Silvia Lupi. The studio distinguishes itself by its intensely imaginative yet logical approach to the built environment at every scale of intervention. Completed projects range from individual buildings to urban infrastructure. Besides his professional activity, Sandro has been conducting a continued investigation on the Greater Venetian Lagoon as an urban space by promoting and curating a number of structured investigations and academic programs, among others with the European Commission, TU Delft, UC Berkeley, and more recently as a visiting critic of the Venice program of the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia. Uh, Nicolas de Monchot, which you can see on the screen, is our professor and head of architecture at MIT. He is the author of Spacesuit, Fashion in Apollo, MIT Press, and Local Code, 3,659 proposals about data design and the nature of cities, published by Princeton Architectural Press in 2016. Catherine Moll, her partner, is an architect with a decade of experience leading the design and construction of net positive energy buildings and award-winning adaptive reuse projects in California. Together, they use architectural tools to transform objects, environments, and urban situations, strengthening and improving connections among buildings, cities, and ecologies. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, we, we don't have here your um, uh, bio, but I think that Nicolas can, can introduce you if he's um, connected. Okay, go ahead, Nicolas. Uh, well, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Bill briefly. Bill is the Balmerana Professor um, at the University of Virginia and director of a more than 40-year-old um, uh, program that the University of Virginia has in Venice, founded by uh, Mario Valmarano, former professor himself at, uh, at EVA. Uh, and Bill was my colleague for many years at EVA and has an enormous expertise about architecture and landscape in Venice that we'll get into today as well. Fantastic. Many thanks for joining, uh, Bill. 
So, um, Laura, do you, uh, uh, sorry, Paola, would you like to start? Um, I think you're the first. <coughs> okay. Paola. Paola, Paola, Paola. Paola. yeah, yeah I said. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, Laura, hello to, uh, hello to everybody. Thank you for, well, thank you, uh, for get us started. Uh, I will be brief. The, our project uh, focuses uh, on the resilience of Venice. Very recently, Venice, uh, on the 25th of March, uh, celebrated uh, 1,600 years of, from its mythical foundation, which was on the 25th of March, 2021, at the, exactly at noon, at the clock of noon. Uh, this is obviously a mythical foundation, however, the records of the history of the Republic of Venice are very clear for more than 1,000 years. And Venice has an enormous and many examples of resilience. The most famous is the diversion of all the rivers which were entering into the lagoon and depositing their sediments. In our panel, we have a famous map of the 1600 by Sabadino, which shows all these uh, rivers entering uh, from north to south inside the lagoon. The problem was that the lagoon was the city of Venice. Uh, in the early 1500s, the, the League of Cambrai saw all the powers of Europe allied against Venice because they wanted all the great, vast territories of which Venice was dominating. And the, uh, the, the army of the uh, Holy Roman Empire, the uh, Holy Emperor, arrived at the border of the lagoon. Venice was safe from the cannonades of the emperor because the lagoon was protecting. So the famous example of resilience is that in the mid 1500, the Venetians started systematically to divert the course of the rivers. And the, the, the works were enormous. You can imagine it is not nowadays with our technology, but they changed the course of the rivers between the middle 1500 and the middle 1800. And now the rivers uh, go into the open sea, their mouths south and north of the lagoon. This is a very famous example of the resilience of Venice. There are many others, but I wanted to touch on something which I think is the greatest challenge of our present times. And the challenge is the challenge of climate change. Venice is a very fragile city, and the beautiful map uh, in the Venice room on which we walk and the cracks all over beautifully demonstrates this fragility. And Venice is fragile in its structure and the subject to all the changes we have seen uh, in these last 50 years uh, I don't need to give examples. Uh, uh, sea level rise everywhere. We have uh, some calculations of which show the exponential increase of uh, floods in many storm surges. Floods are storm surges. That is the surge of the Adriatic Sea. Very similar to the storm surges which uh, are produced by the hurricanes in the North Atlantic Ocean in cities like New Orleans, Galveston, New York, and Boston. Uh, the other examples are the heat waves. Basically, since the famous summer of 2002-2003, there is a heat wave every summer in Europe. And then there are the fires, there are the droughts. This, all these phenomena, which are extreme events, are increasing exponentially. And this is a climate change. Nobody nowadays who has a, 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 a grain of salt can deny the effect of climate change. Venice must face this challenge, which is the last and most important challenge of our times, and not only for a city like Venice, but for all over the world. If we think about the Netherlands, another example of a country which is actually under sea level. But Venice is particularly uh, important because it is fragile. It is a city which uh, has uh, resisted every type of challenge. And I do think that uh, uh, there isn't the solution. Venice has or is already equipped 
to resist the climate change. And I'm talking about the MOSE. The MOSE in these last two years has been demonstrated to function perfectly. I know the MOSE inside out. I was a consultant of the Consortium Venezia Nova from 1995 through 2013 when there was the famous explosion of the MOSE. So I have followed the development, not only the technical, but the, pro the project itself, how it was designed. Uh, how it was tested, all the assessment of environmental effect which took, uh, we consulted and we helped the consortium, we are four professors of MIT uh, for four years, and in 1999 we produced the report on the, on the effects. Well, after Unfortunately, the problem in Italy is not the technical problem, because Italians, the MOSE is a fantastic technical project. It is the unique, the only one barrier which is underwater for the requirements of not disturbing the landscape. And something like the barrier in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, which is like I call the claws, the claws which are giant and could never happen because they alter the landscape. Venice and the Lagoon are UNESCO patrimony, and they are subject to the rules of the European Union, and something like that could never have been done. Also, the Netherlands have a, a, a very big floods, but the barrier of Rotterdam has been closed once in 10 years. The Mose, in these last two years, the, last two, the first week in October was up for four days. I sent a slide to uh, Jorn. I don't know if we have the time to show it, but the Mose protected and cut off the extreme peaks. The problem with the MOSE is not the technique. The technique is flawless. The, uh, it has taken 25 years to complete it, but not first the scandal for which the works were paralyzed for five years. Now, uh, the MOSE is not yet completed, not because the barriers are not in place and don't function. They function perfectly and they have saved San Marco Square in these last two years. I do not know how many days, but if I have counted them and I have a report how many times uh, the MOSE has been raised. Uh, the problem is the, the bureaucracy and the length of all the decision-making process for which the, the deadline given to the super commissaria for the completion is the 31st of December 2021. It will not be respected because what is missing is not the function of the barrier itself, are the power plants to raise the mose. So when they complain it costs a lot, there are people, uh, teams, teams of workers for each of the barriers, there are four, two in Lido, one in Malamocca, and one in Chioggia, which go there to raise physically, to maneuver physically. But the MOSE works. The MOSE, I'll say this in the context of climate change. The MOSE, even though it was designed uh, in the late 90s, the project was adapted. At the beginning, in the late 90s, there was not yet the prediction and the realization of what is happening to climate. And the MOSE was designed to sustain an increase of 25 centimeters. Now it was revised. The MOSE has been designed to raise an increase of sea level by 2,100 of 60 centimeters. Uh, it may be not sufficient because of the last IPCC report, which has come out uh, one year ago, 2019, we have a figure in our panel in which the sea level is predicted until 2300, which is sort of, uh, well, let us say a little bit uh, too much because the predictions uh, uh, by that time are totally unreliable. But the MOSE can be adapted. And technically speaking, the adaptation to a higher sea level rise by 2100, technically speaking, would not be difficult, is totally plausible, and it was predicted in the original report made in 1998, the project of the MOSE. In any case, I have one slide which I would like to show you, which I sent to Jorn, uh, because it shows uh, all the works which are already going on because it is not only protecting the city, the lagoon, from the high water. If I can have the slide enlarged, I'm afraid you cannot see it. In any case, 
There is all the protection of the littorals. Uh, we had with Lauren, you have a collaboration, Mati, and you have, a, which has been going on since 2017. We had a summer camp in Palestrina at the uh, uh, village of the workers, which I knew when there were the real workers. You know, just the cafeteria was filled with 200 people who were working at the Malamocco uh, barrier. Uh, the littorals have already been reinforced inside raising the wall of protection and outside breaking all the underwater, breaking the waves. And there are a lot of complementary works going on inside the lagoon. And the map, which I'm sorry you cannot see, but it is courtesy of the Consortium Venezia Nuova. It is the last um, uh, uh, movie explaining the function of the Mosa made a few months ago. So I, am, uh, I have an optimistic nature. Uh, I think uh, this is already in progress, in, in, in other words, I think the tools are already there to protect Venice until the end of this century from the consequences of climate change. And if these consequences will be more dire than they were predicted, say, 15 years ago, the system which has been designed from the technical engineering point of view can be adapted to sustain a much higher sea level rise. It was designed for 60 centimeters, but the, thing, the idea, like all physical ideas, is simple. You change the inclination of the barriers. In this moment, they are inclined 42 degrees with respect to the horizontal sea level. You raise the inclination. And this was predicted in the original report going back to 1998. So this is the great challenge. I am confident that Venice will will give another proof of resilience. It has resisted for more than 1,000 years. Uh, it, uh, uh, there is in this moment uh, at the Palazzo Ducale, I have seen it, I hope to be able to see it, the, 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 the exhibition, uh, Venezia uh, 1600, 1,600 years. They say Venice was born and reborn. It is another way to talk about the resilience of Venice. Venice was born and reborn. I do believe that uh, if we will ever succeed in, in getting together in agreement, Italia from the left and the right and the south and the north, the technical tools, the engineering tools are there. And again, I, I am positive. I think Venice has already the tools and the means to resist the challenge of climate change. I won't be there, but it doesn't matter. Venice will be born and reborn again. So that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, and will be the, another proof to what is the greatest challenge and the great proof of resilience which we are facing in our times. Laura? Grazie, uh, grazie. Thank you, thank you, Paola. You have already said a lot about the work we have carried out together. One thing I like to stress about our discussions before is that this relationship, this work we have done together uh, has been going on for some years now with very different competencies, Paola and me. We have different competencies, but this uh, brings us towards an interdisciplinary relationship, uh, a relationship among different competencies that in a context like the context of Venice, thinking how the theme has been dealt with in this Biennale is increasingly necessary and indispensable. We have to work on complex systems, and this requires a complexity, an articulation of disciplines, an articulation of knowledge to work on the themes we are dealing with. Venice, and not only Venice, and this is quite clear in the Biennale of this year, Venice can be a, a laboratory, a privileged labor, laboratory for observation because of its structure, because of its history, because of its form, 
because of its peculiar characteristics, but also because of its apparent immobility. It seems to be immovable, and instead it is moving, it is dynamic. Also from a physical point of view, it has many elements that are static, although this is not the right term I want to use. The work we have carried out, Paola and me, in our panel, and that is part of this uh, discussion and reflection I was mentioning, is trying to combine different points of view and also to combine her research work with my research work on the city and that bring us to translate, and this was included in our panel, the scientific aspect, the processing uh, of the effects of climate change and their impact on the city. What does this mean from a quantitative point of view? The problem of high tide, Paula, was stressing the role and the function of the mobile barriers at the port inlets. These barriers, Mose, only work with high tide at a certain level, but the city is flooded nevertheless during the year at different levels, and we have represented this with different maps up to a quota of 110 centimeters above uh, sea level, average sea level, there are maps of what parts of the city are being flooded. The city coexists with these floodings from its very origin and also its population, but there are effects on the texture, on mobility in the city, on the economic and social texture of the city. It has effects and impact on the, on the heritage of the city and have economic consequences, also from the point of view of the ability to respond to these impacts. And this has uh, has had an effect on our work on Venice. We will uh, have to keep into account the consequences for the whole planet, uh, the sea level rise, the impact of a sea level rise, as Paola was saying. For Venice, we have a solution. What about the rest of the country? What about the rest of the world? Maybe solutions have to be found again in a harmonized way with uh, the different uh, uh, sections of knowledge we have. Paula has shown uh, a slide. We have rebuilt the projects that were developed in the lagoon a complex system made of a city, of emerged land, of mudlands, shallow waters, waters uh, in relation with the sea, an extremely articulated system that for decades now has been studied and on which investments have been made. What we really wanted to show was how articulated this system is. It is not just an intervention which is the most apparent, if we can say so, the intervention that was most discussed in the city, that is to say the mobile barriers at the port inlets, we are also referring to minor interventions, the elimination of pollution, uh, intervention for the urban texture of the city, the rising of the, uh, uh, of the banks, of the, uh, of the streets that face onto the canals, a coordinated intervention. This 
seem to us to be a way to show how a system has to be organized and rethought and redesigned if necessary. And here I stop. Thank you, Laura. Allow me to add that I really hope that our collaboration will go on for many years in the future after this stagnation uh, due to the pandemic, unfortunately. I hope we will continue afterwards. Um, I don't know if uh, Lorian is already with us or we have to jump directly to Nicolas. She's online. Oh, perfect. Hey, Lorian. Nice seeing you. Yes, nice seeing you too. It's um, it's Arna actually. Um, so uh, it's Lorin's uh, colleague. Um, Lorin couldn't make it uh, unfortunately. Okay, so go ahead, Arna. Yes. Um, so I can share my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Just one moment. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, talk about our project, uh, City to Dust. Uh, but first of all, very shortly, so uh, about our studio, Studio LA. It's uh, founded by me as well as uh, Lorine. We're based in, uh, in Amsterdam. And um, yeah, actually, we use architecture as a tool to uh, investigate societal issues and to uh, develop new perspectives on societal issues. And we, we have certain themes that we uh, work on for yeah, several years now um, that you see here on the screen. And um, yeah, this question of how will we live together actually really fits our uh, studio and our way of thinking um, very well because it's about people and the way that people um, interact and um, yeah uh, live uh, together um, and so we focused on the theme uh, as uh, emerging communities and of course if we speak about communities uh, and we speak of the location uh, of the biennale venice uh, we know that there's a lot uh, at stake when we talk about communities uh, because of uh, yeah the the the, the, the well overwhelming power of tourism the effect it has on the uh, residents uh, of, of Venice and the city um, as well. Um, so here, this was of course uh, before uh, the pandemic started. Um, but uh, yeah, you see what kind of uh, yeah what kind of impact this uh, yeah crowd of people that want to see the city and its beauty uh, what it has. Um, and at the other other hand, there's also a lot of protests of people uh, yeah living in Venice, wanting to preserve it, wanting to have a, yeah a livable. Uh, environment actually um, so and um, this duality um, and actually that this beauty of Venice is at the same time also something that can destroy the city um, we wanted to show uh, so we wanted to show the impact that visitors of the city have on the city itself um, and our idea was to show yeah to make people also feel their impact uh, so not only to see it but also to feel it under their feet to feel that they have a, yeah impact direct impact effect on the city and on its soil the ground uh, so we use this um, this reference I reference image of of uh, ground uh, breaking um, and we drew uh, this as well, like a city that is under your feet breaking. That was our first conceptual idea that we wanted to show. Um, and the way we translated it into the design, we also wanted to do it with a product that is uh, yeah, from Italy, from the region of, uh, of Venice. Um, and of course, yeah, you all know Terrazzo um, and uh, yeah, here are some images of terrazzo workers uh, in Venice. Um, 
And we we found um, in the Netherlands also an Italian, actually originally from the area of Venice, uh, producer that makes terrazzo. It's called uh, Tomaello, Giulio Tomaello. And he helped us to produce um, uh, actually a new product, a new floor that uh, that breaks when people walk over it, but breaks very slowly. Um, and we as a studio, we always also work um, yeah, on... Um, with like the existing context. So for us, it was really, it was never idea to promote kind of our Dutch work in Venice. We really wanted to do something that says something about Venice or Italy as well. Um, so to kind of embed ourselves in the local uh, context. For us, that was really important. Um, so the map of Venice, um, that was our idea to show that on the big floor in the arsenal of our space um, and we did a lot of research in what kind of colors we found in the arsenal and in venice and uh, we used them also in the map um, so here are some photos of that and then we started uh, yeah testing these tiles and actually developing a new product of terrazzo tile a product that is very thin um, so thin that, um, yeah, when you walk over it, you start breaking it slowly. And of course, all producers of terrazzo will say, you are crazy because we don't want our tiles to break. <laughs> so it was, a very, it was a very strange way of thinking also for the producer to develop a product that breaks instead, instead of a product that stays uh, in, uh, in, in, this, in the exact state. Uh, so we did a lot of hundreds of test tiles uh, till we came uh, to the original, to the one that we uh, used. Um, here are some photos of when we started uh, started uh, the build up. Um, and we did that also uh, with an uh, Italian uh, team, uh, something that was for us also very important to also work with people that are from that region. And so here you see the end result. So this is the floor when no one walked over it uh, yet, uh, photographed. And in the back, you see photos made by Marco Capaletti. And uh, he made uh, photos, uh, photos of Venice um, during the pandemic when actually there was this complete lockdown, when it was completely empty, and when this beauty of the city also started um, appearing again. So this you see here, on, and on this side, uh, you, uh, we made a documentation of how the floor and the breaking of the floor develops in time. So above there's a camera that makes photographs every 20 minutes. Um, so we can follow this process uh, completely. Um, so here you see some photos of it. Um, and what was very interesting in watching and observing how people walk over this floor was that it actually showed also the way that tourists behave, the scope of way of behavior. So there were people that noticed that the floor uh, started breaking and making a sound and that immediately they were like uh, afraid that they were breaking something. But there were also people just walking over it with their phone, looking on their phone, not even seeing the floor and just passing by without yeah noticing anything and there there were people that were that started jumping on it uh to to uh, break uh, the floor <laughs> uh, because they on purposely they purposely wanted to break it um so there was this kind of scope of tourism that we saw uh, within the visitors uh, as well uh, that was very interesting so these are some shots of um of how it slowly started breaking. And this is actually how it looks like now. Um, so it's starting to yeah, fall apart completely. Um, and uh, one of the first, the first step uh, was made uh, by Ilya Leonard Pfeiffer. He's a Dutch writer, but he lives in uh, Genova, uh, and he writes a lot about uh, tourism in newspapers, but also um, in uh, in his book Grand Hotel Europe. Um, and also, this book inspired us to, uh, yeah, within this project. Uh, so we asked him to to make a first step, but also to write a column about a, a project. And I just want to show you. 
uh, a short clip of how the uh, how the tiles break, uh, but I just have to switch screens. Um, I'm sorry. Yes, I hope you see, uh, yes, you see it. I don't know if you hear the sounds. The architectural yes. installation City to Dust wants to pose the question to what extent Venice in its embrace of mass tourism can symbolize the future of the old continent as a whole. Because the tourists trample her soul. But without tourists, it's equally doomed has been sacrificed to the touristic monoculture. Even the residents are all but gone. Every single step is for every single visitor, a physical confrontation with his or her potentially harmful impact on the environment The destiny of mass tourism is the death of Venice. Yes, so that that was what I um, yeah what I wanted to show you. So th thank you. Many thanks, Arne. Um, Nicolas, are you ready? Uh, yes. Fantastic. Um, uh, I am ready. Let, let's just share screen here as well. Thank you, Arne. That was wonderful and Paula, uh, amazing presentation as well. So we're going to do our best to to. Um, start a conversation between all three of us. Can you see my screen now? Yes. All right. Uh, so uh, our project, um, uh, which is a collaboration between uh, my practice modem, uh, San Berbiza, and the Venice program of the University of Virginia, represented here today by Bill Sherman, is really uh, uh, also a direct response to Hashim's question to us, how can we live together and how can we live together in particular in Venice, both the global, which has always come to Venice in the form of uh, trade and tourism, and the local, all the different parts of Venice and the lagoon. Uh, it's very clear that we need new ways of living with each other in this context, uh, and new ways of understanding what we live, which all the projects today um, uh, uh, give us in the Venetian context. And our project in particular asserts that we need um, uh, in order to find new routes and new pathways through the city and into relationship with each other, we also need new maps and new ways of moving. The project takes as its cue the ubiquitous infrastructure of Venice, and in particular, the uh, graphic outlines given to the transportation um, through and around Venice by Giulio Citato in 1977 in his pathbreaking work for Acitivu and ACNL. Uh, and this graphic language uh, uh, appears in two important ways, which uh, our work addresses together. One, as a kind of ambient visual infrastructure to the entire city and its lagoon, which, we, which, we, uh, uh, which is a language that is ubiquitous as it is uh, generally invisible in this context. Um, but is also an attempt to extend that language as a basis for new ways of thinking about the city uh, in, in its largest sense, new ways of mapping it, and thus new ways of finding relationships through it with each other. 
The transport map is, of course, uh, 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 our, our operating table here. Um, it has its, uh, despite its lack of uh, veracity, it's not a map in the in the detailed and data driven sense that Paula's uh, work represents. But it is also, but it is still a, a very important way to depict the city and tell stories about it. As, for example, uh, in the way in which the uh, service uh, through the city was modified um, at the height of the pandemic uh, last year. There are, of course, many essential qualities of Venice and its lagoon that the map evades or obscures. The scale of the lagoon, the, its shallowness, its marginal quality, the presence of other kinds of human and non-human actors in this landscape. Let alone the strict separation um, between the landscape of the terraferma and that of the lagoon in the city's infrastructure and even in its sense of itself. This, of course, is stark contrast with other ways of abstracting and looking at the city throughout time. From the very beginning, uh, our project uh, uh, existed as an interchange between three artifacts, a way of, of thinking about the city through mapping it and a way of planning and organizing routes through the city. The routes through the city and the workshops that, that it represents will be extended in time past this Biennale um, uh, as both a response to COVID, but also a commitment to long-term work in the city by UVA, MIT, and others. Our very first step in uh, arranging uh, uh, and constructing a new map of Venice and its possible uh, 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 routes and transportations was to balance, in fact, two different ways of looking at mapping. The, the, the generalities of hand-drawn, of, of beautiful hand-drawn abstractions that tend to populate transportation maps and our desire to actually construct a map that really represented the city uh, uh, with the traditional veracity of a map where every point on the map uh, uh, corresponded to a very specific point in the lagoon. Given the scale of the lagoon and the difficulty of, of abstracting it into a traditional transportation map, we partnered with our um, uh, graphic design collaborators, um, uh, uh, Joris Malta and Daniel Gross of Catalog Tree, also ironically in the Netherlands, um, uh, and uh, 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 basically constructed our own map projection, um, uh, a GIS transformation of the lagoon that allowed it to both be abstracted but represented um, in a traditional map-like sense. This projection um, uh, is presented in an abstraction and uh, uh, is presented on the map itself, um, uh, which contains, of course, all the traditional um, uh, uh, transportation lines in the lagoon, but also new lines that we've imagined uh, and proposed, uh, new relationships, uh, and then the trajectories of our workshops um, uh, uh, and uh, lines of research th through the lagoon here visible in green, orange, and blue. I'm going to hand it over now to Sandro, but Sandro, um, let me, I'll be your slide operator. So just uh, uh, let me know when you want to uh, pass forward from here. Thanks, Nicholas. But I think you have said <laughs> most of it. I just want to reiterate the, uh, the intention or the approach uh, for, of the project from our point of view. So that, uh, let's say, without, uh, let's say, going too deep into uh, how to uh, achieve that, uh, let's say, or, or we have heard before about the, let's say, the big infrastructure project going on in the past and in the present with the Mose or with the uh, cruise ship uh, 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 understanding of where to put them. Um, we just wanted to show that uh, something different is possible by simply enlarging the scale of observation. I think scale is the key uh, word in, uh, in, in this, and uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is very uh, important when you talk about Venice and its surrounding. If you just focus on the city of Venice, of course, you see something. If you just enlarge the map and you try to consider Venice not just as, let's say, the historical part, what everybody thinks of when he's uh, the thinking of Venice, but you just consider this as just a part of a much bigger metropolitan and territorial context. Maybe this is already an approach and a point of view that can suggest uh, possible alternatives and possible solutions. And this is what we were trying, and this is what we tried to, to show by uh, representing Venice through an imaginary metropolitan or metro or uh, 
can be subway, can be uh, 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 gondolas, can be uh, um, uh, jets, whatever. We, this is not the point. It's just a matter of considering the connections. Uh, so just please just go quickly through the through the uh, pictures, uh, uh, Nicholas. Next, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So just uh, uh, well, the arrival of it, the connection to the mainland, all the yeah, just this is a picture showing or already a lot of uh, 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 contradictions. Let's say next, or through the more uh, remote location and imagine some alternative and not unique connection, the borders of the lagoon to the inside islands. At the moment, it's, there is one way, which is the bridge going into the, the, the center of it. But maybe we can imagine something which is more uh, um, uh, network-like. Yeah, next. The other way, yeah. Or, yeah, this is the big infrastructure, let's say. Again, we just, uh, the yellow parts are, let's say, points of interest. We of course, we don't have the solution for these points, but we think that could be uh, relevant. Yeah, to, how to go inside, what's the connection, what's uh, big, small and medium boats, where to go, where to stop. Is the lagoon an open, uh, an open uh, uh, area or a closed one? Next. Yeah, and this is just... Uh, other example of other the borders. So what is the border? What, what what is the city of Venice? Where does Venice finish? Uh, if can we consider now Padova or uh, Treviso as part of somehow Venice? At least Mestre for sure. So this is the questions is trying to uh, to raise next. Yeah, as, again the last part is the the the, the mainland. A point so as represented as part of the same network. Next, yeah, showing that maybe we should really enlarge the scale of observation to um, to be able to understand it, uh, to understand especially its future and how we will live together in Venice if there is a way. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, and then uh, okay. Uh, this is these were uh, stickers uh, placed on the on the map because as part of the uh, um, of the project, as a, f a very important part of the project was let's say some a series of workshop and itineraries to explore these routes, and this was they were uh, meant to be part of the program of the University of Virginia. Unfortunately, this could not take place because of the restriction of traveling. Uh, but uh, yeah, I give it to uh, Bill now, and yeah. for sure we will do it in the future. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Sandro. And it would have been actually an extraordinary experience because of the combination of 20 students from Virginia and a group of students coming from MIT to work together in a workshop to um, and partnering with the HTV to uh, explore remote parts of the lagoon as well as to explore these connections between the mainland and the city. I think just to reiterate one of the, the points that I think is underlying the entire project is that rather than viewing Venice as a dying city whose population is leaving um, a kind of uh, museum artifact stranded in the lagoon to actually see it as the kind of heart of a thriving metropolis that's in fact growing of uh, several million people um, in the Veneto region. Uh, and starting to look at these systems and networks and the ecological relationships between this human infrastructure and the ecological infrastructure of the lagoon uh, becomes a catalyst for perhaps a much more optimistic way of viewing the future of Venice, coupled with the kinds of technological innovation that's happening with Mosaic and other forms of protection related to climate change. 
but it changes the narrative and it opens up a, a new way of thinking about the future of the city that is also deeply rooted in its history and the relationship between Venice, uh, the lagoon and the land. So it has become the structure of a studio that we were to be doing there, but in fact, we are doing here in Virginia with Sandro's uh, participation in which 12 students are taking on different projects that explore these relationships and sort of three general categories of projects. One kind of focused on the bridge and the two endpoints, what happens in Mestre Marghera, uh, Tronchetto, uh, the Piazza di Roma, the bridge itself, and how that singular umbilical cord may be reconsidered um, as a multivalent infrastructure. There's a second group that's looking at the lagoon itself and ways of inhabiting the lagoon and in a way moving out. In some ways, it's building on a studio that Nicholas ran in 2007, um, exploring ways of inhabiting the lagoon more fully both by residents and, and tourists. And then a third group that is really ex exploring distributed networks. What if, for instance, the Biennale were to hold events and to conduct ongoing uh, programs uh, on the mainland side um, and in a way begin to distribute its own impact and its own perception to uh, new territories to rethink um, deindustrializing landscapes on the mainland side, which is inevitable in the future as we move away from petrochemicals and we start rethinking uh, some of those industrial relationships. Um, what do we, how do we think in new ways? So in the in the end, it is our hope that we will be back uh, here, an image from a couple of years ago, students in the lagoon co-inhabiting with uh, the those who live in the lagoon, human and non-human, and exploring this landscape in the future with an ongoing collaboration in a way catalyzed by uh, this project uh, um, for the Biennale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Hashim, would you like to go ahead? Um. First, I do want to thank the three groups for uh, not just excellent presentations today, but for exhibiting work at the Biennale that has clearly taken years, years and years of thinking and preparation. So uh, we're very grateful for you sharing your work to the, through the Venice Biennale with the public. Uh, I will have three questions, and I'm going to ask them all at once. Not necessarily one for each. They're all for everybody, but you pick and choose. Is that okay? okay. Roy, am I allowed to do that? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the first question has to do with the observation that many of you have made about the tension that one observes when looking at Venice and its future between the object and the system. That we have been fixated on the idea of Venice as being this precious object, but actually it has belonged all, throughout its history. It has emerged as an object protected and made possible by a system. And that it is important for us to begin to understand the system better and to be able to work with, with the system rather than with the object. Uh, that tension is probably not too unique to Venice. Uh, we have heard and seen the phenomenon of Manhattanization around where uh, for very large metropolises to thrive, they create this kind of intense object in the middle and supported by a logistical landscape all around, which, is, which remains very invisible. Uh, I wanted to ask in that respect what is unique about Venice, but importantly is systemic thinking as I think Laura challenged us to do, uh, necessary for us to think about uh, the future of cities in relationship to such challenges as the climate. Uh, and how do we integrate that in the architectural thinking, a thinking that has for the most part been obsessed with the object? That's my first question. Uh, the second question has to do with the scalability of the activities that you all highlighted. Uh, Paula convincingly showed us how from its inceptions uh, Venice has always been about shaping and reshaping the lagoon 
being born and reborn in order to continuously survive. It's something like a giant sandbox. Uh, Angelo Bucci, in a presentation we had earlier, uh, remarked that the Amazon is not a jungle, the Amazon is a garden. A garden that has been carefully pruned and protected and enhanced by the indigenous peoples. And that its continuity depends on that interaction with the indigenous peoples. So, are we to open up the sandbox to more exploration and experimentation? And importantly, I think all of you seem to suggest that uh, there's a certain scale to it, a frame and an object in the middle that is quite beautiful, a sandbox per se, but is this scalable? Uh, we, we can think of what is going on in the city as being a kind of modest geoengineering, but as we begin to address the rest of the world, and Laura said, Venice is okay, what about the rest of the world? Are we able to take these methods and approaches to a scale up, to the planetary scale even, in order to address these challenges? And then the third question has a lot to do uh, with the tension that uh, Studio LA uh, demonstrated between the citizen and the visitor, between the owner of the place and the guest. And the, that tension has been a very important one in the history of the city, where the city has always been made of immigrants, people who came here in order to escape from somewhere else. And in a way, the notion of citizenship within cities, at least in its cosmopolitan definition, is always being about a stranger at home. And yet Venice has somehow uh, pushed back and turned into a space that protects itself against that very conception of both citizenship and guests. So are we able, as we move forward with all of the challenges that the city faces and its vulnerability towards its role, its, uh, its role as a haven, but also the conception of citizenship as hospitality as well, are we able to conceive of a city that allows for that duality of citizen and guest not to be in opposition, but to converge? These are my three questions. The object versus the system, the sandbox which is scalable, and the citizen that is also a guest. Um, I'll leap in quickly, Hashim, to, to amplify um, what I think was Paula's fundamental point, which is to say that the, the best version of Venice's future looks to its past, not in a nostalgic way, but as a scaffolding on which to, uh, and model on which to construct possible future realities. We, we know and we've experienced at the historical scale a Venice which looks systematically to the relationship between Lagoon and Terra Firma and the world. We know from a historic scale um, uh, about a city that can scale its ideas um, uh, across the level of that system and, and create other kinds of magnificent objects as well to anchor them. Um, and we know at a historical scale about a, a city that not only uh, pioneered tourism as we know it today uh, over the course of the last five centuries, but also uh, at various points in its history uh, 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 engaged in an incredibly productive balance between um, uh, the cosmopolitan influx of visitors and the generation of new ideas at the, at the urban scale itself. In fact, the management of ecology and the terraforming of the lagoon, which is actually, as Paola pointed out, a very serious and important part of, Venetia, of Venice's history. The, at the time when this was done um, in the 16th and 17th century, I'm not going to talk too much about it because Paola's the expert, you know, th this was a, a, a kind of uh, geoengineering on almost a planetary scale based on the ecology of the time. So as a model for for how we think about how we live together today, all of these pieces of scaffolding are present in the history, um, but the challenges to the contemporary uh, city and those who would seek to steward it, to assemble these in uh, uh, bits of scaffolding in, in new and creative ways to match the, the, uh, uh, the global power of both ecology and tourism um, uh, in our own time. I, I, oh, I think you're muted. But I can't wait to hear what you have to say. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
I would like Laura also to intervene because I know that at Europe, the concept of how guests can become citizen, uh, there is a, a Venice uh, always found the way of having making the various guests to become citizen. And I'll give an example. The best example are the Jewish, the Jew people which were expelled from Spain. The first ghetto in Venice was created in Venice. They were welcome in a way which did not exist in those times. Yes, they closed the door, but those Jews at the end were integrated. And Unfortunately, there were events like Second World War and so forth, but those, they were guests, they were welcome, they were integrated, they became part of the, the, the city, which was based on entrepreneurship. And I know that at Europe, they have been rethinking how to imagine, uh, if I'm correct, how to imagine new guests can become citizens. And for instance, one of the emphasis Venice has changed. Uh, the industry time, which was based on petrol and so forth, cannot exist any longer because it is destroying the planet. So that industry, which was a Marghera, must change from the industrial point of view, that the fact that this industry cannot exist any longer has caused the immigration of people. But Venice is not yet a museum because of uh, what was a proposal which I heard and would like Laura to intervene is just the intellectual ferment of our universities. Our universities, both Kafoskeri and UAB, are superb. UAB is arguably the top university of architecture in Italy. And so, and they are attracting more and more students, and these students to make Venice, to bring intellectual energies to Venice. And the Biennale in spite of the pandemic, has been a fantastic success, uh, even though it was uh, delayed. And the Biennale is not only a museum, the Biennale is life, because the Biennale brings life and brings ideas. So these are things which can make a new citizenship and that belong to the historical tradition of Venice, which attracting people of the, from different parts of society and make a new nucleus, which is based, it cannot be based on chemical products, but it can be based not in going visiting the museum, but I have young people who live there and who increment, the, they become the new citizen from being guests. Uh, maybe, Laura, can you intervene um, describing some of the activities which I know you are doing at UAB, just in this concept of making Venice a new paradigm? for a new model of citizens, citizenship. The last question, how can guests become citizens? Laura, are you there? Wow, a responsibility, no? It is a great responsibility to answer to such a question. Venice, Hashim and me, uh, people do not understand it. We get it. You get it? You get yeah. it? Okay, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry. My, okay, but I, I, I feel more comfortable with it. <laughs> there is uh, an English translation. It was one of the proposals uh, in your program for you, wasn't yeah. it? Um, allora, il, uh, il tema the theme of the guest becoming a citizen is a theme on which universities can certainly do a lot about. Many of the students who come to Venice for their courses remain in this city and become citizens. I myself I was a guest, and now I am a citizen. I work here, I contribute to this city. So this is a huge work. Paola was referring to universities and research centers, the large institutions, the Biennale. All of these places are working places, and they are not museums. They are not static museums. So I absolutely agree on the fact that Venice is not a museum. It is not yet a museum. It is a city that has a capacity 
of uh, being alive, also with tourism and not only with the structures. I do not want to uh, attach uh, too much responsibility to tourism. Tourism has a strong impact, but the city lives for tourism. And this is a, an important and sensitive subject to discuss. There is a, certainly a problem of over-tourism in Venice, but there is also an economic problem. The city has to produce something different if it doesn't want to produce tourism and culture and institutions, Paola was mentioning before, can certainly work in synergy to build alternatives to tourism. Culture, and not just culture in terms of cultural production, sensu stricto, uh, produced by a museum, the Biennale, I'm also referring to tangible and intangible culture this city can produce. And I think this is a, a chance for the city to be born again, to resist to the effects, to the negative effects of this type of culture. I think we can work a lot on this. And I am convinced we can find solutions to this problem. As regards the capacity of this city, of Venice, to work on different scales, well, this was quite well explained by Sandro Biza and Nicolas de Monchot, this scalability. Uh, in Venice, which is a physical scalability, but also an historical scalability. We have to be able to skip, to, to change from one scale to another in order to find the best possible solutions. This city has always been related to the surrounding territory, and it couldn't be otherwise both from an economic point of view, but also from the point of view of the construction of the surrounding territory. This city has lost 100,000 inhabitants that have moved to the mainland. And it is not only happening in Venice. This is something that is happening all over the world in contemporary cities. But Venice has contributed to the understanding of the possibility of working on different scales. Allow me to add that we shouldn't refer to Venice as the historic center, but rather as a municipal unit. Uh, the, uh, what you are exploring uh, with the bridge uh, connecting the mainland in Virginia is similar to Venice, and the mainland will be the future of, uh, of this city. Uh, people run away from the historic center, but they built elsewhere. Mestre is full of activity, activities that are connected to the, me to the center, to the historic center. Do not forget uh, the link that exists with the islands of the lagoon, the surrounding islands. Uh, you haven't visited the islands. We had three summer schools in Pelestrina, which is an extremely lively island in the lagoon that has a great history and that's still an active part of, of the life of the city. Do not forget the link that still exists with the island of the lagoon. We have now a municipal city made up of the historic center, but also expands towards the mainland, like the Serenissima did in the past. It conquered Padua and Treviso. It is now being built in a different way without forgetting the islands of the lagoon that are still a lively part of the life of the city and have an active part in the economy of the lagoon, a more traditional economy. Add 
the islands to your map, uh, if you can, please. It would be very interesting for me and Laura. We will have to meet here in MIT, in MIT. Many professors will uh, join us in discussing our next camp in Pelestrina for next June. Come and visit us. We have uh, 15 students from M MIT and 15 students from UAV with very different uh, educations. But this is what is interesting for us, putting together uh, science and technology, which is the object of the study of uh, MIT. Uh, to put it together with uh, a local uh, type of education, uh, complementary and uh, totally interdisciplinary in uh, nature. Our students enjoy themselves. They integrate uh, technology, architecture, urban planning and engineering. We hope we will succeed in organizing this fourth course, a summer course in Pelestrina, and we invite you all to come and visit us so that we can start developing a real conversation with you. Sorry. <laughs> But this is always part of the possibility of enlarging the city of Venice. Anyway, um, no, I just wanted to say something about, uh, let's say, uh, as, as an architect, I'm particularly interested in the a little different topic that you brought into the, 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 uh, the questions about the relation between object and system. And uh, uh, which I think it's very uh, relevant, uh, talking about Venice, of course. Yeah, it, it, we can consider the old city center as an object eventually, or made of a lot of objects, but then it's inside the system. And I think uh, this, uh, again, we, uh, we could take uh, uh, ecology maybe as an example. Uh, uh, ecosystems, when you want to inter intervene in an ecosystem, you can only introduce process, uh, not uh, intervention. And I think in this sense, also uh, the, the urban planning, I don't know if this is the right word, but uh, uh, should be considered and treated as a process. And uh, so first of all, learning from the past, we should have a clear idea of some intentions. So the Venetians, as Paola was saying, were able to divert the rivers because they had a very clear idea of what the lagoon should be and should remain. And, they, and what they did is to, they created the process. This took 100 years to, to have an effect. And uh, so the same we should consider uh, nowadays. I think our problem is that we are, uh, it's very difficult in our time to think in long term. It's very difficult to think in uh, 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 large scale, and it's very difficult to have <laughs> clear ideas. But so maybe I would revert the thing. Can an object uh, uh, influence the, the system instead of the other way around? So this would be a great, uh, great challenge. Uh, being this some sort of, in, let's say, we are it, still, it's the architecture biennale, so architecture still is, has a role in this. I think this could be a good uh, uh, experiment, at least. Well, I would, I would turn it quickly back on Hashim here as well, because I think one of the, the most exciting things about the way that the biennale was conceived in this cycle was the idea that uh, uh, an event in Venice should not be a self-contained object in the world of architecture, but a catalyst in a larger political and social landscape. And so uh, uh, I think that itself is a kind of spatial and temporal idea, which is very relevant to the larger discussion. I, I take this as a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> I might just add one, one more uh, comment about the this question is related to the to the systems, but it's actually related to all three questions, but um, also on this question of the citizen versus the stranger or the visitor or the guest, is that there is a 
group, um, we might say that it isn't quite such a strict duality. There are many who, um, from around the world, who in a way have deep commitments and relationships in uh, in Venice, but and the challenges of Venice uh, actually lead to perhaps the production of new institutions that can address these great challenges that Venice faces, but really as a kind of uh, example uh, uh, or an intensified version of the challenges that the entire world faces, where Venice um, has a future as a place where people are coming together through uh, a kind of intellectual discourse, building on institutions like the Caposcari and UAV and the Biennale um, and others who, in a sense, um, bring a, a group of people from around the world who in a way share in Venice's fate. And rather than posing it strictly as a duality between you know, the millions of tourists and the hundreds of thousands who live in the region, I actually recognize that there is a, another global community that um, has a kind of institutional foundation in Venice and is perhaps uniquely structured to have a set of conversations and collaborations. Uh, that look at the future not only of Venice, but by extension, uh, the uh, the planet. And I think that's in some ways the, the hope of uh, thinking about Venice, uh, in a sense, in uh, different terms and in perhaps larger terms than uh, the um, what might be seen as the specific challenges of just one city. I would also uh, love to add uh, something about this uh, this duality between uh, the citizen and, and the guest, um, because of course there's this um, idea of, or this image of, of Venice, a touristic one, uh, but that's not a real image of Venice, because Venice consists of course out of hundreds and thousands of stories and histories and memories, uh, but those are not really known, of course. Um, and I'm very much inspired by the uh, uh, architect Bogdan Bogdanovic. Uh, he's from uh, Yugoslavia. He wrote a lot about reading the city and about writing the city. But to read the city, you really have to be interested as, an, uh, yeah, as, a, as a visitor. You really have to dive into the city and to try to relate to the city and uh, its inhabitants. Um, and not being uh, only a consumer, but really, um, yeah, realizing that you're part of something bigger, part of this uh, of this city, that you also make it, make the city together with all the other people, although you're maybe a tourist. Um, so I think it's also about a way of, um, yeah, of approaching a city, a way of of, of looking. Uh, at it and realizing that you're part of something because that's what we also tried within our installation to uh, make people aware that maybe one single visitor does not make a lot of impact but all the visitors together they make a large impact and so being aware that you're part of something larger uh, is really important and then if you zoom out uh, within this problem of visitor versus um, guest or stranger, we of course see that a lot of European countries that have this re rich history, they try to preserve it, and uh, but also use it as, as marketing strategies. But this preservation, this uh, keeping it as it was, is really important. And they wel welcome a lot of tourists to see this beautiful um, yeah, architecture. Um, and at the same time, in our borders of, of, of Europe, there are a lot of people um, waiting uh, for a better future, trying to get away of, um, yeah, of, of horrible circumstances. And uh, yeah, we all as Europe decide not to uh, let them in. But if we think more long term and realizing how can we make this rich history, this architecture really sustainable, how can we really make our city sustainable, then we need people to realize that. But we don't have those people. We don't have that knowledge. Um, so I think that that there's a lot, yeah, that there's also this bigger problem that connects to, um, yeah, to, to this duality between tourists and, um, yeah, citizen of, uh, of Venice.
I don't know, the idea that, that Venice itself should be a, a scale model of the welcome that we would uh, uh, should give to strangers at a continental and global scale is a really powerful idea. Mm. It is indeed. Um, I think we are very close to the finishing time, which is at 4.30. Um, so I don't know, Hashim, is there anything on your side that you would like to comment that on? Um, up to me. Okay, yes, I don't want to like extend the thing too much because like, uh, yes, we're, we're supposed to be arriving to the, um, to the closing moment of this conversation. Um, maybe I would limit myself uh, to make a very, very small observation uh, perhaps and then to ask a question which, may, which I hope that you can, even if difficult, you may answer succinctly. Um, so actually for me, one of the beautiful things as well, like seeing like together the, the, the presentations, maybe actually stems from one of the images that um, Arne showed, um, which are like these photographs of um, um, empty Venice, no, in a way. No? And how actually what, what these photographs show is what um, a strange and difficult condition we need to actually have those images, no? because they are actually the result of a pandemic. Otherwise, the city, as much as we may love its architecture and as much as we may decide to have a kind of a, uh, an unmediated contact with that architecture, is actually like a continuous uh, living uh, organism always, no? Something that is completely like embedded, as Sandra said, in a, in a somehow like a continuous process. So I think that is something that is like very interesting coming from all your presentations that has to do with this acknowledgement of a living condition. And no matter what that condition is, like no matter whether we have like Mose helping ad addressing some of the consequences of climate change, as Laura said, at the same time, we will have to live at the same time with other of the consequences of climate change at the same time. Or of course, there will be measures to control tourism, but it's impossible to completely like, get rid of it. So there is always going to be like the necessity of somehow staying and considering and maintaining like the living conditions of the city as something that will continuously be a problem and a question that we'll have to address. I think this has been like tremendously interesting. But then my last question, and because this was a little bit of a, something that I, I think I, I took very clearly from what you presented. My last question, which I hope you can answer qu uh, uh, quickly, is that you know, um, it was interesting to see something that for me seeing the, 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 the exhibition itself was not so evident. No, is that actually each of you rely on certain way of mapping the city. You're, the three of you make maps. These are like completely different maps in a way, but all of you make maps. So I have a question, uh, which is in a way, what would you take uh, from each other's map? in a way, like what would you incorporate to your own uh, actual mapping, but also, and if this is like too complicated a question, what else in addition to the map you think it is necessary to bring? I just do very quickly. I think we, that we mentioned already that, that we wanted to have a real life exploration we really strongly believe in experience as a as a as a as a, as a way as a as a uh, as, as a method to uh, learn and to understand the territory by physically being there uh, so that's i think and re the fact that we miss it it's uh, really emblematic of the actual condition as well uh, but yeah that's let's say the map, in our intention, was just a starting point for the uh, uh, on-site activities. That also was the idea of the Vaporetto stop, which is symbolically uh, uh, showing, uh, let's say, showing itself as part of the of a route, and uh, so it's like a symbolic uh, uh, starting point of this of this exploration. So that's definitely what uh, we we're missing. Uh, sí. mm, la 
the map, uh, the mapping as a tool, is a powerful uh, tool for analysis and restitution. I totally agree with what Sandro was saying. That is uh, the fact that we have to build and share this map. We have to decide together what kind of map we want to create. This might be an interesting exercise that was impossible uh, during the pandemic. But this is a, a type of exercise we should start doing, identifying specific issues, because we cannot map everything at the same time. But this might certainly be a way to find common roots in this city. And as regards the things you were saying about pictures, nice pictures, nice from a certain point of view, it is the beauty of horror, uh, the magnificent horror you are surprised by. When you see the physical space as you have never seen it before, I, I saw people living besides me that I had never met before. So this uh, period of lockdown was a surprise for many points of view, but also in the tragedy of what we have experienced. We have seen many things for very specific reasons. Going back to your question, I would say we should try and build maps together. We, me and Paula, we have uh, made maps that were made of uh, data. We could get to the same conclusions by building by reinterpreting those data in a more collective way. And this might be very interesting. I think we the result would be very different. Qualcuno? Uh, I'll let Sandra's answer stand for, for all of us on this end. Yeah. What about you, Ernie? Do you want to add that? Well, yes, I think that's what what showed me is these different projects and maps showed me is that, of course, a map is a way of understanding a certain aspect um, of, of the city, of a place. And um, yeah, I think it showed me that it's important to have these maps existing next to each other because each map shows a different perspective or a different way of understanding. So. And I think these layers and different perspectives next to each other, that that's the really an important thing and an important way of observing a place. I'd just add one, one quick comment that, that that inspires is that in a way we don't design, we don't act, we don't behave in relation to reality as it exists in some concrete sense out there, but only in relation to the maps and the models that we carry in our heads. And so to actually make these maps, to make them physical, to put them out there and to experience them either physically by walking on them and understanding that interaction or uh, by moving out into the landscape, into the city and understanding it on a completely different basis and building a new map in a sense, that, is, that becomes the foundation for perhaps a new way of designing, thinking, behaving, and responding to these challenges. Fantastic. Many thanks, uh, Bill. So um, I think we are uh, done here. So thank you all very much. Hashim, would you like to yeah, make uh, some conclusion? I just want remark? to keep a promise I made earlier, which is uh, to engage the public in the discussion. But knowing the logistics of having to stop early, I wanted to ask both Sandra and Laura if they can keep my promise by engaging the public after we end and maybe answering questions live with the people in the audience because 
we owe them uh, their patience and presence. Uh, thank you all for attending and uh, see you soon. Thank you.